The decision to invade French North Africa had been made. The decision on the supreme commander had been made. And yet, rarely anywhere else in history had a military commander been placed at the head of an operation of which he thought so little. Brigadier Vivian Dykes lamented, I am very sorry for Eisenhower. He has been buggered about. Eisenhower himself wrote, The decision to invade North Africa necessitated a complete reversal in our thinking and drastic revision in our planning and preparation. Where we had been counting on many months of orderly buildup, we now had only weeks. Instead of a massed attack across narrow waters, the proposed expedition would require movement over open ocean areas where enemy submarines would constitute a real menace. Our target was no longer a restricted front where we knew accurately terrain, facilities, and people as they affected military operations, but the rim of a continent where no major military campaign had been conducted for centuries. We were not to have the air power we had planned to use against Europe, and what we did have would be largely concentrated at a single, highly vulnerable base, Gibraltar, and immediate substantial successes would have to be achieved in the first engagements. A beachhead could be held in Normandy and expanded, however slowly, a beachhead on the African coast might be impossible even to maintain. No study of the forces or equipment available for the operation had yet been undertaken. No strategy or tactics had been formally constituted. Preoccupied with difficulties elsewhere, the British had done comparatively little planning for the operation Churchill had so diligently promoted. Not suspecting that anything like torch would actually happen, the Americans had done nothing. There was no agreement yet on where the troops would go ashore, only that they would do so. There was no study of troop ships or cargo vessels that would be needed for the operation. During the first week in July, 400,000 tons of shipping was lost to German U-boats in the Atlantic alone. If that rate of loss was maintained, torch preparations were bound to be seriously affected. Invading French North Africa raised three fundamental questions for the Allies. When, where, and who? Eisenhower submitted the first outline on 9th August 1942. It envisioned landing at Casablanca, Oran, Algier, and Bonn on 7 November. However, the British disagreed with capturing Casablanca, seeing it as unnecessary and delaying the launch of the operation. Actually, the North African decision raised more than just three questions. How much shipping would be available? The amount of shipping would directly affect the size of the operation. How many landing craft and escorts could be procured? Numbers of landing craft and escorts would affect the task forces and assault landings available. Air support was also questionable, relying on aircraft carriers and a small airstrip at Gibraltar. Would the French fight? Would they offer less resistance if the force were all American? Another unknown would be the reaction of Spain and Germany. Would the Strait of Gibraltar be closed? Would the Nazis reinforce Africa? The Allies had their own questions to answer. How would London and Washington coordinate planning? They were plagued by multi-service and multinational issues. As Eisenhower put it, the situation was vague, the amount of resources unknown, the final object indeterminate, and the only firm factor in the whole business are instruction to attack. On 22 August, Eisenhower submitted a second plan to the Combined Chiefs of Staff, the CCS. He had scrapped the Casablanca landings and had a tentative launch date of 15 October, although it allowed for likely delays. Four regimental combat teams, RCTs, would sail from the United States to attack Oran. Another convoy from the United Kingdom would split in the Mediterranean, with one half consisting of an RCT and a British Infantry Brigade. The other half would sail for Bonn, carrying the U.S. Ranger Battalion and a British Brigade. Two armored and four infantry divisions would be in follow-up convoys to reinforce the drive on Tunisia, and two armored and five infantry divisions would also defend against Spanish Morocco. This would end up being nine American and four British divisions. However, in the wake of the news of the disastrous Dieppe raid, the CCS concluded that the plan was simply too weak on 24 August. George Marshall instructed Eisenhower to concentrate the landings in French Morocco in Oran. When the British were informed of this on 26 August, they were profoundly disconcerted. They objected to making Iran the easternmost landing because it seemed unlikely that they would be able to prevent access reinforcement of Tunisia. Also, the Atlantic surf at Casablanca would be much rougher than at points in the Mediterranean. On 28 August, after much discussion, 
the British agreed to drop the question of landing at Bonn and Philippeville. Chief of the Imperial General Staff, Alan Brooke, called this, quote, a much wiser plan, end quote. Two days later, there was another telegram in the transatlantic essay contest between Roosevelt and Churchill. In his message to the Prime Minister, Roosevelt reiterated his two key ideas that the landings would face only token resistance if done by Americans, and that landing in only two places, i.e. Casablanca and Oran, would be safest. The Chief of Staff Committee, CSC, were still reluctant to attack Casablanca, so in the interest of compromise, they made certain that there would be landings in Algier. On 3 September, further compromise reduced the Oran force by one RCT to land at Algier, and the next day, a combat convoy of 10 to 12,000 troops were also committed. Churchill finally, quote, agreed to the military layout as proposed, end quote. Roosevelt wired, quote, huzzah, end quote, to which the prime minister replied, quote, okay, full blast, end quote. Now with torch disrupting Allied shipping worldwide, Eisenhower had to go back to the drawing board to please both Roosevelt and Churchill. On 9 September, Eisenhower's minutes record, quote, November 8 is mentioned for Torch. This is a tragedy, and every effort must be made to save at least 10 days, end quote. The final plan was delivered on 20 September. The objective was, quote, to secure French Morocco and Algeria with a view to their earliest possible occupation of Tunisia in the establishment in French Morocco of a striking force which can ensure control of the Straits of Gibraltar by moving, if necessary, into Spanish Morocco, end quote. Now, five RCTs and two armored combat teams from the United States would secure Casablanca. An infantry division, an armored combat team, and a ranger battalion would attack Oran, and the Eastern Algier force would consist of two RCTs, two British brigade groups, and two commando groups. Reinforcements would bring the strength of the Casablanca and Iran forces to seven American divisions, while the Argiers group would eventually total four to six divisions of the British First Army. The U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff, JCS, approved the plan on 29 September, followed by the British CSC on 2 October. Orders were issued on 8 October, one month before the operation's start date. The Allies' decision-making process left little time for training. The U.S. 1st Infantry Division received orders for Operation Torch on 4 September. It transferred to Glasgow, Scotland and practiced invading a town called Oban on 18-19 to 19 September. This caused some concern because the division's actual objective, top secret at the time, was Oran. The division sailed from the Clyde for Africa on 22 October. The War Diary for Transport Division 11 gives a typical example of the training involved. Two ships had trained for 13 and 5 days before leaving New York, but two others had just completed refit and had untrained boat crews. The U.S. Atlantic Amphibious Force had slightly more time. In August, 10 transports spent a collective total of 50 day days exercising with their landing craft, but three of those transports had 13 days each. It did not help that the calm waters of the Chesapeake Bay did not at all resemble the rough Atlantic coast of Morocco. Waters off the west coast of Scotland were studded with rocks, which meant that the landing craft would have to approach slowly and with great caution. This would be the opposite on D-Day, when they would have to scoot in quickly to avoid shore batteries and unload their troops, then scoot out quickly. A lack of spare parts meant some had to be cannibalized in order to repair wear and tear. In addition to a lack of training, the American Army and Navy had different administrative structures, communication systems, and supply procedures. They also had fundamentally different procedures for amphibious operations. Among other things, their textbooks prescribed different ways for disembarking and unloading under combat conditions. The Army wanted to get as much equipment and supplies as possible on the shores as quickly as possible either on the backs of the troops or along with them. The Navy wanted the men disembarked quickly, which meant they would be lightly equipped, then follow up with supplies and equipment. Their differences reinforced the conviction of each that the other was incapable of understanding the intricacies of amphibious operations. Early training exercises completely lacked cooperation. 
Admiral Kent Hewitt, a task force commander, conceded, quote, That gave them some of the rudiments, but it was unfortunate in some respects because they knew just enough to think they knew it all, and they didn't. In addition to standard ordnance, a bulletproof seven-passenger car, quote, of normal appearance, end quote, was requested for Eisenhower's use. Also included were 25 locomotives, 288 railway cars, two 1,000-bed hospitals, one 500-bed hospital, three 250-bed hospitals, 750,000 bottles of insect repellent, six fly swatters, mosquito nets, basketball shoes, 16,000 feet of cotton rope, five pounds of rat poison per company, and $100,000 in gold coins personally entrusted to George Patton. A special crate requisitioned in a frantic message to the War Department on October 18th held 1,000 Purple Hearts. The Western Task Force alone consisted of more than 100 warships, transports, freighters, and tankers. They set out from different ports along the east coast of the U.S. so as not to attract attention from enemy agents who were believed active at key centers along the coast. The center and eastern task forces departing from Britain carried $500,000 worth of tea, hand tools for 5,000 Native African natives, 390,000 pairs of socks, and special dictionaries that translated British into American, noting, for example, that an accumulator is a battery, that indent means requisition, and that a Dixie is a bucket for brewing tea. On September 8th, Eisenhower sent Washington a 15-page cable confessing that roughly 260,000 tons of supplies had been misplaced after arriving in the UK and asked that the War Department send a duplicate shipment. The memo went on to explain that the American system for marking and dispatching the equipment was very poor. One U.S. Army regiment and its equipment arrived on 55 different ships. Fifth pilferage at the British docks reached 20% of tonnage. The Western Task Force Air Group left on October 3rd, followed by most of the troops and transports on October 23rd. The Center and Eastern Task Forces left the Firth of Clyde from October 17th to the 22nd and steamed toward the Mediterranean. Ted Roosevelt wrote his wife, quote, The die is cast, and the result is on the knees of the gods, end quote. Thanks for your time and consideration in watching this video. Tune in next time when we examine the espionage and subterfuge that came before the landings. Please like, share, subscribe, and we'll see you next time.